with that, um, I would like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ted Hutman. Um, Dr. Tut Hutman has been with us here at UCLA for a long time, <laughs> I can't remember how many years. Uh, he was a graduate student here and he worked with a very distinguished Dr. Marion Sigmund, who is our leader for uh, many, many years of the Autism Center and a great autism researcher, a tremendous loss to us, uh, to us all um, when she died a few years ago. Um, Ted was also a postdoctoral fellow in her lab and um, essentially took over her lab and her, uh, uh, continued in her legacy um, since she's been gone. He's an assistant professor here today. Um, he's been studying um, uh, infants who are at high risk for developing autism and following these infants uh, through their development to try to find early signs in the first year of life and the, and the second year of life um, that, um, that indicate changes that will be associated with autism in the future. So very important early diagnosis work. And today he's going to talk to us about spared versus impaired social behavior in infants later diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ted Hutman. All right. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Dan for inviting me. Thank you all for coming today. I think I'm supposed to tell you that I have no financial disclosures to make. Um, I think I'm not supposed to tell you that I'm open to your proposals at the break. <laughs> it would be tacky to do that. Um, so I'm just going to get right into it. This is my orientation slide to make sure everybody's in the right room. Um, since I'm going first, I will remind you, you probably all know this, that autism is now um, diagnosed on the basis of two different categories of impairment. Um, impairment in social communication slash social interaction, that's still the first category of impairment. And the other is the presence of restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. So that's the insistence on sameness and the um, insistence on a specific routine. I would like to draw your attention, ask you to focus on item C, which is not you know, primary in the diagnostic criteria, but we used to say that symptoms had to be present before the age of three, and now in the current DSM, we say something a little bit different, which is uh, symptoms must be present in early childhood, but may not be evident until social demands exceed limited capacities. And what I want to emphasize here is that this allows for, first of all, for later diagnosis, for the possibility that, that maybe impairment wasn't recognized early in life. And the upshot, the ramification and the relevance um, that I'll come back to later, is that um, kids who are diagnosed later tend to be less severely impaired. There's a reason that we're missing them and, and getting them later on. Um, and item D, I mean, this, this sort of goes without saying, but um, symptoms limit or impair everyday functioning. This is not just quirky kids. This is a, a really disabling uh, condition and it creates a lot of uh, expense and need for care and strain on caregivers. So that's, um, that's also quite relevant to the work that we do in uh, early detection and trying to catch it earlier. Um, the average age of diagnosis is still around five. Most cases are diagnosed between four and a half and five and a half years. But um, study after study has found in, in, in retrospective reporting by parents that parents were aware of impairment often by the first birthday. So one of the goals of our work is to close that gap, is to try to understand what's going on between the first birthday and say the fifth birthday. Um, and the reason that we're interested in that is that if we can identify children earlier in development, we can start treatment earlier. Um, and it's not just because we need work to do, it's because early intervention seems to get the best results. In studies of um, predictors of treatment effects, um, age of entry into treatment is a strong predictor, meaning earlier 
it's, it's negatively related. Um, earlier entry into treatment gets the best results. There isn't a cutoff. I'm often asked, you know, by what age should, should children start treatment? Um, it just generally across the board earlier is better. And the reason is that um, it's sort of a nip it in the bud kind of a philosophy, but um, the earlier we can start, the less of a chance a child has to fall behind his peers. It's like um, minimizing the number of days that your child's out of school or something. Um, but also, brain development is happening so rapidly early in life that the sooner we can get on it and um, and get the uh, the neural systems working and the social behaviors working, you know, optimally or close to optimally, the better the outcomes seem to be. But also, from a basic science perspective, what we are trying to do, my focus in, in this work in early detection is behavior, but we're trying to characterize the behaviors that are indicative of the onset of autism with the goal of, and, and actually now we're um, working together with um, neuroimagers and neurologists, uh, we would like to characterize the underlying neurobiology and use that as a pathway back to the genes that are the, um, the seed or the, the determining fact, a determining factor in both the neurobiology and the behavior of autism. So that is kind of my effort to get you oriented. And now I turn to um, my ulterior motive, which is to disorient you completely. Um, you don't actually have slides printed out, is that correct? I'm so relieved because if you did, they would bear limited resemblance from the time. Okay, so this is how we do it. We, um, I'm going to just give you an idea, an overview of the approach to studying infants at risk for autism. We recruit a big bunch of babies, <laughs> real babies. I'm not talking about my colleagues at all <laughs> until the break. Um, let's just say all of these babies are at high risk for autism by virtue of the fact that they have an older sibling with autism. Autism is one of the most highly heritable of all of the neuropsychiatric neurodevelopmental disorders. And so we know, now that we've been at it for a dozen years, um, we know that infant siblings of a child with autism have about a 19% chance of also being diagnosed with autism compared to um, a little bit more than 1% in the general population. So about you know, 15 to 20 times higher um, chance of getting the disorder. So we enroll by six months of age, and now in our current study, we're enrolling by six weeks of age. Keep that in mind in case you know any pregnant people. Um, we are enrolling high-risk babies early in development, long before symptoms are evident. And um, we are testing them, I mean, here we're testing them six times in the first year, but the general design is that um, babies are tested about 6, 12, 18, 24, and 36 months of age. At 36 months of age, we feel more confident about rendering a diagnosis. So we do a, a full clinical workup and we determine, um, we judge whether or not we think the child is on the autism spectrum. I'll explain that a little bit more. So at 36 months, we will split that high-risk group into three smaller groups. And the first group, as I said, about 19% of the sample will receive an autism diagnosis at age three. The largest group, and this I think is the good news, is indistinguishable from the low-risk control group. So uh, about 46% of the samples um, appear to be typically developing on the basis of language measures and cognitive measures and social behaviors and adaptive skills. Um, then there's this other group. It's about a third of the sample, and they don't meet criteria for either of those other categories. They're not, we're not comfortable saying that they're typically developing. Essentially what they have is um, subclinical manifestations of autism. So, there might be an inter there might be a full blown language impairment. Um, there might be elevated scores on the ADOS, which is our diagnostic measure, so that they're close to cutoff, but they don't meet criteria for autism. Um, this is predicted in a neuro uh, in a genetic disorder that there will be an intermediate phenotype. So that's this group, the high risk atypical group, and that's the thirty six month classification. And those three groups can be compared to low risk controls 
who are assumed to be developing typically, but we verify that at 36 months. And as you know, not, not all low-risk kids are typically developing, so we, we check. So this is kind of the overview. As I said, we've been doing it for a dozen years, and there are now a bunch of studies out there that demonstrate pretty clearly that between 6 and 12 months, symptoms are starting to emerge. And the way that we know that is that we look at the same measures at 6 months, and we don't find differences. So there are no differences between the children who go on to get autism um, based on the 36-month outcome and typically developing kids. The behaviors are the same in all these categories. We check the same behaviors at 12 months, and all of these, these are sort of categorical, but these constructs are affected by autism by 12 months. So something is happening be between 6 and 12 months, and I'll just give you a preview. It's not vaccines. Um, but these are the categories that, that have been detected as changing between 6 and 12 months. Eye contact, visual tracking, disengagement of visual attention, so the ability to reallocate your attention, or the baby's attention from one thing to another. Um, orienting in a variety of ways, responding when somebody calls the baby's name, um, orienting to a shift in the gaze by the examiner or the parent, um, and following points. Um, social smiling changes from 6 to 12 months, and social attention, social interest, and social affect all seem to be different, at least relative to the control group by 12 months. And so this is a graphic that I've shown in this forum before, but um, showing what we found. This is a study we did with um, our collaborators at UC Davis. It's kind of, it's showing the onset of autism, actually. So these are, um, well, I'll describe... My legend didn't make it. Um, oh, no, there it is. The, um, the blue line is, is the typically developing group. So they're tested at 36 months, found to be typically developing. And so that is the trajectory of typical development. And you see that the, the red line, which is the autism group, um, that the divergence takes different shapes and forms. So that in directed vocalization, um, the autism group doesn't really change from the six-month level, but the, uh, the typically developing group does. It, um, it grows, it improves, and so in all of these graphs, um, you see that the distance increases over time. Um, what's really striking about these graphs, um, gaze to face and social smiles, is that we, we documented a, a real loss in skills. Uh, babies were doing more of it at six months, and they declined in the frequency with which they demonstrated those skills. And so one of the things, in terms of the theme of this talk, when the lines are touching <laughs> or when they're close to each other, statistically there's no difference between the behavior of a child who goes on to get autism. I would say that those skills are intact. In, in these cases, they're intact early in development and, the, um, and they're impaired later on. Um, so I'm, so that's going to be, that's like the launch into my theme. I'm going to now talk about, I think, five recent studies that have been done specifically in social attention. And I want to get into this kind of juxtaposition of ability and disability and how it's not always quite this simple that first there's ability and then there's disability, but these two phenomena are intermingled in interesting, complex ways. And that's going to be um, part of your dis disorientation in the next whatever amount of time I have remaining. So this study came out of the United Kingdom. This is um, done by a consortium of researchers there. Called, it's called the British Autism Study of Infant Siblings. It's an eye-tracking study where they looked into, well, as you see, preferential attention to faces. Um, and what that's about, this is a test of the social motivation theory of autism. And here the idea is that Kids who are interested in faces and are motivated to look at faces, are they're going to get a couple of benefits out of that. One is that they're going to elicit nice interactions with the caregiver. Caregivers notice that interest and reflect it. But also, they're going to um, maximize opportunities to look at and engage with faces. So they're going to get a lot of practice. They're going to work on, um, they're going to, work on faces, essentially, the more time they spend with it. So the practice is going to yield secondary benefits, such as 
sensitivity to the direction of gaze, which is going to be important for joint attention. These are examples of benefits. And another one would be the ability to interpret facial uh, expressions of emotion. On the other hand, if that's lacking, if there isn't social interest, social motivation, then a child is going to miss out on those learning opportunities. So in this sense, autism would unfold and it would get worse over time and there would be a, a gradual separation between development and autism and typical development as opposed to everything being broken at first, which just doesn't seem to be the case. Um, all right, so this study, what they evaluated here was the face pop-out effect. In typical development, by six months of age, if you show a baby a face in a field of distractors, non-social distractors, babies alert to the face. The face is the first thing that they look at and the thing that they look at longest. And in this study, what they did, this is, um, this is the non-face stimulus in the it is exactly matched with the face in that it's the same shape. It has this, the exact same pixels. They're just rearranged. So the, the salience and the luminance are, are perfectly equal. Um, and then there's technology, and there's an automobile, and there's an animal, and typically developing babies all look to the face first. So the hypothesis here, here is that kids who go on to get autism won't do that because they don't have the same level of motivation. And guess what? That's not true. At seven months, if it, so all of the black shapes represent the high risk group split up as, as I mentioned earlier in three, that there's the high risk typical, high risk you know, atypical, and then the high risk ASD groups. And they all look most at, they, they look first to the face and most to the face. And what this shows is within, at the seven month time point, my pointer isn't working very well, they just, they separated the measure as the first five seconds and then the last 10 seconds of the, the presentation of 14 different um, arrays of, of a face with non-social distractors. And um, the high-risk group just matches the control group perfectly at seven months. And at 14 months, this is weird, the high-risk group looks, appears to look more to the face than the low-risk group. And so this, this doesn't disprove the social motivation theory, by the way. I like the social motivation theory a lot, but this isn't consistent with it. It doesn't support it in infancy. One thing that's really also quite unusual about these results is that the high-risk group holds together the whole way. So the kids who go on to get autism don't differ in their looking behaviors from the high-risk kids. High-risk kids who do get autism don't differ from the kids who don't get autism. That's not a common result. So, so that risk for autism seems to be influencing looking patterns in response to a face and field of distractors. Um, this is a study by the same group, and this looks at one of those secondary benefits that I suggested earlier, the um, sensitivity to gaze direction. And here what they did is they showed um, a face big face in the middle of a video monitor in front of the baby, baby sitting on the mom's lap, and they've got an eye tracker going, and they're also recording brain activity. And, um, and basically, all that happens, this, is, this effect is accomplished with Photoshop. So the photograph is taken with the woman looking directly out at the baby, so that's direct gaze. And then they Photoshop it so that the only thing that changes between conditions is that her gaze appears to move. And when you juxtapose those images, the gaze actually seems to move, even though it's two still images. So what they looked at was, um, you know, first of all, where the babies were looking. And here again, they found that the two groups, high risk and low risk, kids who went on to get autism and kids who didn't go on to get autism, they all looked at the eyes um, essentially an equal amount. The, statistically, they were equal amounts. So looking patterns are intact, <coughs> spared. But the lowest, the controls were more sensitive to the change in gaze direction in terms of the brain activity at the cortical level. Um, and it's, for those, I'm not going to do a primer on um, ERP because I couldn't, but I will say that um, early components in ERP are more in a sensory direction and later components are more about information processing. And the differences show up in the later components, which means that it's the interpretation of the information. This does not support sensory differences, 
but the control group was sensitive to gaze shift and the um, kids who went on to get autism seemed not to notice it at the neural level. Again, behavior is spared and the brain activity is what's different. So here's another idea that I wanna plant. Um, brain research is important and it should be done and, and you should fund it and I will stand outside the door with a cup at the end of the <laughs> session. Um, I'm not kidding. Um, so this is another eye tracking study. This is done at Yale. And this is also about one of those um, secondary gains of specializing in faces where the premise here is that um, typically developing babies will follow um, the model's head turn. She's gonna look at toys and she's gonna look down at the peanut butter and jelly sandwich that she's making. And that typically developing babies will follow her head turn or her gaze shift to the objects that she's showing interest in or that she's, that she's attending to, and the babies who go on to get autism will not follow. And so the way that they measure it is just where does the baby look? There, are, there were four conditions, I think, in this study. One is that she makes the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and she's busy with that, and she's looking at it. One is that she looks up like this, and she talks to the baby in mother ease, because that's supposed to elicit their attention. And one condition, she's looking at a toy, and the toy is still. And in the fourth condition, she looks at a toy, and the toy moves. And there was also the assumption that kids with autism would look at the toys more than the other groups because they're more interested in objects than people. So again, hypotheses, a look at toys, and they won't follow her gaze when she looks to either a toy or the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I'm going to skip ahead a slide. Um, there is no difference in looking behavior to toys. There, there was a difference. This is also a funny one. This is the opposite of that um, face pop-up study that I talked about. Here there are only differences within the high-risk group and not between <laughs> any of the high-risk subgroups and the low-risk controls. But this is about time spent looking at the model's face. So the kids who went on to get autism looked less at the face than the than the high-risk kids who didn't go on to look at, to get autism. Um, but there is a marginal difference with typical development, so it's a fairly small sample, and, and it's reasonable to suspect that that, that's, that would differentiate kids who get autism from kids who don't. Um, the differences are really at, at a slightly broader level, that kids who went on to get autism paid less attention to the whole scene. They didn't look at the screen as much as the kids who didn't get autism, and they didn't look at the whole person. So the attention differences seem to be rather general at, um, at this point. It's not about face, it's, oh, and I didn't show these graphs, but they, they wanted to see if they looked more or less to the eyes and mouth, because that's been shown in older people with autism. Equal looking to the eyes and mouth across groups. So the, the differences are, are general, seen person and face level. Um, this study, more social attention, more eye tracking, um, got a lot of attention because it was published in Nature. Um, but this is a really, and that's not the only reason, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting study. This was done at, um, it was published at Emory by a group who had been at Yale, and I, I think maybe they collected the data at Yale. Um, and, What's really cool about this study is how much they tested. They did the same test on kids at two, three, four, five, six months, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21, and 24 months. Um, that's a lot of time points. Um, I can't remember how many it is, but it's a lot. So it's eye tracking, and the, and the paradigm is this. The model is talking to the baby, and they're, what they were interested in was naturalistic interaction. So she does some hand gestures with songs and she does, um, I think it's more talking than singing, but it's um, supposed to be mother-like. I don't know about you, but my first reaction was, my mother never looked like that. But, um, <laughs> but she's cute in other ways, for sure. <laughs> um, so what you see here, it's not just smudges on the scene, but the red data is um, fixation data for kids who went on to get autism. And what you see is looking at the mouth and then looking away, actually diverting attention to the background. And here is shifting attention from 
it's, it's her hands that are more interesting than her face. And in the, um, the typical group, attention is, is focused on her eyes. And what they found was really interesting. And, and these data, it's again a small sample, but it's, it's very promising um, research because they, they tested the kids so frequently. Um, they never test this, but it looks like the red lines, kids with autism, it looks like they start out paying more attention to the eyes at two months. And the, the thing that they want to focus, and they do this explicitly, is that attention to the eyes is intact at two months. And it's statistically equivalent until about nine months. But by testing it so many times, they're able to say very conclusively and convincingly that attention to the eyes decreases in a linear fashion from two to 24 months in kids who go on to get autism. Um, on the other hand, there is a slight positive slope in the um, TD group. So those kids are increasing looking to eyes. So this is a really striking, um, compelling, story about the onset of autism. The other place where they found differences is in attention to objects. So it's not, um, it's not exactly consistent with the peanut butter and jelly study where there were no differences in looking to the toys. But if you look at the six month time point, which is what was studied in the peanut butter and jelly study and the moving animals, the groups would be equal. So the skills are still are absolutely intact at six months. So when you look matters, how you look matters, how frequently you look also matters. More, um, more evaluation gets you a lot richer and, and you know, to my mind, more useful information. Um, I think that's all I want to tell you about this. Here's another eye tracking study and it's another um, flavor of social attention. Uh, this is actually not what the babies saw. This is um, what the researchers used to analyze the data. They mapped out these zones of interest. So the babies saw um, a regular, I think it was a black and white picture. Um, and then the researchers wanted to see where the babies locked their attention, where the fixations um, occurred. And this study had three different conditions. One was a static image, and it, so it's just this picture, woman's not doing anything. And the next condition, it's video, with the idea that a naturalistic um, presentation might elicit more differences. So she's smiling. The, the second condition is characterized by high affect. And the third condition is, um, is speech, where she is reciting um, nursery rhymes. And here is what they got. In the static and the affective condition, I'm sorry, I didn't say this, but this is at six months of age. Maybe it said that on my title. Um, the static and the, the high affect condition, um, there are no differences. So looking at the, the different parts of the face, one, I think one of the hypotheses here was that kids who go into autism won't look as much at the core features of the face, or at least they won't look as much to the eyes. They might um, stare at the mouth more, but they didn't find that. They found that the groups um, distribute their attention in similar ways in the static and affective conditions. And I've left one out. Um, drum roll, please. In this, oops, in the speech condition, there are differences. So what's that about? The, um, the kids who went on to get autism looked less at the inner features of the face when the model spoke. So that the addition of um, auditory information, but it's not just auditory. It's social, it's language. There's a lot, a number of things change from one condition to the next. This is not a flaw in the study, but this is a really interesting, complicated finding. It, it sort of argues that multisensory processing might be an issue in autism. You may have heard that before. Um, but it's interesting that the, the attention to the core features of the face is not impaired across the board. And you know, one of the arguments that I'm hoping to make here is that we need to pay attention to both the, um, the skills and the deficits and to understand where those differences are. Um, finally, this is not a study about social attention, but I thought that it, um, it tied in pretty nicely with the theme of the talk um, because it's about the emergence of autism. Just 
thinking back to the last slide, I was talking about the ability to integrate information from different sensory systems. So that's auditory and visual information um, that one seemed to kind of derail uh, or disrupt functioning in the other. Um, relatedly, one of the theories of autism is that there's a problem with connectivity of areas in the brain. So the autism, you couldn't locate autism at one point in the brain, but it has to do with the coordinated efforts, um, the interaction among brain regions. And so that's what was studied by this group um, based at Chapel Hill in North Carolina. They looked at, uh, I think it was 79 high-risk babies here. And um, they, this is a brain imaging study and they're looking at connectivity. So they're looking at the development of white matter tracts and um, they looked at 15 tracts that have been implicated in autism in other studies, and those other studies would definitely not involve babies, so in children and adults with autism. Um, and what they found was in 12 of those 15 regions, uh, the development of white matter from two to 24 months was slower in kids who went on to get autism. And I think, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, I, the measure that they use, um, I think there are significant differences at, the, the graph is misleading because their first time point was actually six months. At six months, the, the measure suggested greater density, white matter density, in the kids who went on to get autism than the kids who didn't. So that maybe looks kind of, maybe seems like a good thing, but then slower development from six to 24 months and then lesser density in the autism group at 24 months. So they're definitely um, recording differences in the development of white matter, which is associated with connectivity among brain regions. And again, you know, you see that the lines cross around 12 months. So if you did, if you only tested at one time point, if you tested at 12 months, you would say, eh, it's not there. And, and this is, so I'm only showing one of the 12 regions that they studied, but, um, but this is a, a representative slide. And, um, you know, if you only studied this at six months, you would also get a misleading picture and you'd say, no, there's, there's hyperconnectivity. Well, you know, that, that might lead to um, a different explanation, but, but these longitudinal studies are really useful in um, showing us atypical patterns of development. One thing I want to emphasize here is that this study this phase of this study ended at 24 months. Um, so diagnosis, and, and I said before that, um, that most of us, you know, we snooty infant sibling researchers think that you have to wait until 36 months because diagnoses are thought to be more stable from that point on. And so that leads me to um, this. The question is, this timer, oh, this is counting, okay, great. Um, I'm gonna wrap up pretty soon and leave time for questions. The end of the panel, of oh, the end of the day. Okay, because I'm not in that panel. Okay, um, sorry, just a little, we don't get to talk much, so it just seemed like a good opportunity. So my question, um, and all of us in the field have been wondering when we should do diagnosis. Um, does 36 months really matter? And this is a nice study done by the Baby Siblings Research Consortium, which is about 25 sites internationally, where we're pooling data, where we're sharing data from um, basic common measures, um, rarely eye tracking, but things like the IQ testing and diagnostic testing and um, adaptive skills. In this study, um, we looked at 418 high-risk infants, so all of them had an older sibling with autism. 110 of these infants, of this subsample, uh, received an ASD diagnosis at 26 months. So it's, it's slightly enriched for the autism outcome. That's a little bit more than the, the average that we've reported previously. And the design here was that we, um, we did clinical best estimates, so it's a clinician's judgment of whether the baby's on or off the spectrum at 18 months, at 24 months, and 36 months. So here we're considering 36 months to be the truth. Um, I never do that. 
but I just um, the, the, it, the thing is that it's not the truth because development doesn't end at 36 months. You, hear, you heard it here first. But we're looking at 18 and 24 months as predictors of outcome at 36 months. And the basic question is how, how good are those early diagnoses? And so here's the, the array of data. It's a little bit complicated, but I'll start with, in blue we have the true positives, and those are kids who were diagnosed who were autism positive at all three time points. Um, and the green is kids who are autism negative at all three time points. So blue is true positives, green is um, true negatives. And then let's see if I can get these right. Um, so the 72 down here, had ASD, but they were judged at one of the earlier time points not to have ASD. So those are false negatives. We thought they didn't have it, but they did have it. That's a pretty high number. It's a pretty big percentage. And these are the ones who we thought had it. So they received a diagnosis at either 18 months, or 24 months, or both. And then they, at 36 months, they were found not to be on the spectrum. So the, the short answer is that if we, well, there is no short answer in any of this. Um, sorry, I wish there were. Um, if we find that a child has autism early in development at either 18 or 24 months, we're, we're doing a pretty good job. If we identify it, if we see it, it, it seems to be there. So kids don't seem to go off the spectrum. Where we're not doing as good a job is the sensitivity rating is if we judge them to be off the spectrum at either time point. Um, now, I referred to this earlier, if you were <laughs> awake yet, but the, the kids who were diagnosed later, so the kids who got a diagnosis at 36 months and maybe didn't get one at 18 or 24 months, they are less severely affected, pretty much across the board. We're generally not seeing these big drop-offs in skills between 24 and 36 months. But we're, we're not really guessing at 36 months. We really see that it's there. But if we, but we are missing kids if we say not on the spectrum at 18 and 24 months. Um, I've got some possible explanations of this because when we say that they're not on the spectrum, we're not necessarily saying that they're fine. You know, we may have placed them in this, this study doesn't show, we may have placed them in that atypical outcomes group. We may put them on a watch list or concerns list. We may be reporting to parents, well, you know, I don't really like the language skills, but you know, he's, the eye contact is so good. So it doesn't mean that we've ever said, you're out of the woods, he's fine. We generally don't do that. But, um, but anyway, the point is that in a study like the white matter track study that I just talked about, where we use 24 month outcomes, we may be missing a lot of people. We may have excluded people, you know, that, that might be a useful sample of severely, relatively severely impacted kids, but, um, but it's not the whole group of kids who, who seem to be on the spectrum at 24 months. So again, with the, um, the spared versus impaired, did I say that right? Spared versus impaired behaviors, um, it's complicated. You know, there, one of the reasons that we would miss kids at 18 and 24 months is because of spared skills because they're doing things well and that can be you know what do you say it's a it's a red herring um it, it th may have thrown us off track or, or may have made us um, skeptical about or reluctant to confer a diagnosis early in development um, but those the spirit skills are also important thank you um because it's easier to shore up and to maintain skills that are present than it is to create skills that are absent so if we can figure out what's there early that might fade later on, I think we want to intervene on that. I think we want to boost those skills. And, and it, not only those skills, you also want to target the impairments. And the, the, one of the reasons that this research is important is to, is to detect the impairments, um, because that's going to give us an idea of who needs treatment. But the point that I want to make is that it's not enough to focus on the impairments. I think that you need to look at the whole package because it's it's complicated. Um, so more research is, is necessary. Um, one of the upshots of this work, one of the takeaway messages is that multiple assessments are critical because you would get a misleading picture if you only did 
one or two. And um, it's, this isn't where we wanted to end up when we started this. We wanted to say, you know, the 12 month assessment is all you need and we know and it's absolutely clear. But development just isn't like that. Um, so I argue for multiple assessments. Um, brain research is really important. Um, we saw that in the electrophysiology study with the sensitivity to gaze direction and in white matter tract development. So the work that we're doing currently at UCLA really emphasizes early brain activity and um, connectivity and um, you know, just brain function. Um, let's see, I'm gonna just skip over these presentations. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about our study in a second. I wanna thank all of the people in, who've worked with me in the Sigmund Lab Funny looking slide and the families who participated it's really hard work we ask them to come a lot to UCLA and they keep coming back and we need them to keep coming back until 36 months as you just saw the 36 time the 36 month time point is critical our funders without whom none of this would be possible and I needed to incorporate a commercial of some sort we are enrolling if you know pregnant women um, we're enrolling both um, high risk and low risk infants so parents who have an older child with autism and um, first children, if there's no family history of autism or well, yeah, families with no history of autism. So we're enrolling by six weeks of age. We're doing brain scans at six weeks. I like to emphasize, since I have a moment to do it, that um, it's natural sleep. We don't drug the babies and there's no radiation associated with um, MRI. So um, it's even the IRB considers it to be a, a minimal risk study. Um, it's still hard work. People need to come back to UCLA a lot. We do the brain scans at night, but um, we really think this is very important work and it's leading to some important findings. Um, I think I have a couple minutes if anybody has questions. Yes. So are the children that are enrolled in the study, are they permitted at the spring for to be engaged Yeah, I think it's a great question though. It's not obvious because um, it's intervention could be at odds with what we're looking for, but ethically, first of all, but you know, just this is about getting kids into early intervention and it would be really hypocritical to say, you know. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, kids who are showing signs of impairment at 12 months of age are referred to a partner project, another aspect of our um, center grant here, which is early intervention. I mean, the, the whole argument is that um, that intervention is critical. There isn't a lot out there yet, and there isn't a lot that's been tested for babies. I mean, how do you treat babies? How do you boost social motivation? So that's being done. Um, it's being run by Amanda Gulsrud here in Connie Cassidy's lab. And um, so not everybody qualifies, but kids who show impairment um, between 12 and 21 months um, have a chance of getting free treatment in a, in a really great lab. Yes? I wonder if you look at the engagement of the month of babies to close to the baby to close to the I have found that even the 12 month of babies when you present them to all kinds of little kids who have an extremely short attention span and you just that's such an interesting question. So the question was, do we um, present 12-month-olds with toys? Um, because the observation is that 12-month-olds, um, that you know, maybe who are showing signs of atypical development can't focus. Um, we do present them with toys, and there are studies that have looked at object exploration and that kind of thing. The findings are really inconsistent on this because one of the, the issues that we see is what, what has been called sticky attention, where some kids just get stuck on one toy. So it's a little bit the opposite of what you're talking about. It's, um, but there are subgroups, so I'm not saying that you're wrong. It's, it's complicated. So attention is affected in some way in autism. Sometimes it's excessive and sometimes it's um, it's never completely lacking, but it's it's impaired in some way. Um, um, I'm wondering if you've considered putting um, a 
what is the time for curves of 15 and 6 weeks? Uh, or 15 and 6 months, I'm sorry. The time for diagnosis and differential diagnosis are not seen, but the trajectory um, slopes look extremely different. And I wonder if you simply look at trajectories at particular points in time, not at, at interval scores, but at trajectory change at point in time, would that be a way to do that? That's exactly what they did in the Clin, uh, Jones and Clin study. It, and they didn't actually do any cross-sectional analyses on that. So the question was, do we look at the slopes of trajectories in the way that they did with the white matter track study? The, um, the eye tracking study that with so many different time points, they did a really interesting thing though. They, um, they did uh, subsets of time points. So they looked from two to three months and two to four months and two to five months. And the, they didn't get a group by time interaction until 12 months, which is a time at which we do get really, you know, sort of big basic, um, you know, cross-sectional differences. Um, but there is evidence of a negative slope there. It's just not significantly different from zero until um, 12 months. So, but, but it's a very good point. The, this is, and it's further to this idea that multiple assessments give you much richer data. It's just that, um, it looks like you need a lot of them. And, and you know, Ami's, the, the guy who ran that study in Emory um, would like to put eye trackers in all the pediatricians' offices. Um, he may have the money to do that. Um, if you talk to me at the break, then maybe I will too, but I don't yet. <laughs> Between attention and oppositionality? No, no, no. Between how you know uh -huh. and children that are with attention problems or with IQ low. Oh. Um, relationships between autism, did you say IQ and oppositionality? Um, I I am aware of studies that have been done at 36 months, so not really early in development using the CBCL, which is a parent report measure of, you know, that's related to um, psychopathology. And I, I don't know that anybody has singled out oppositionality. I think that communication skills problems can lead to, um, you know, a lot of misunderstandings. And, and there's, also, there's almost always difficulty with transitions so that sometimes at a moment when a child doesn't, you know, and every, if everything is surprising, then that child might seem to be up in arms more. So it's not unusual to see oppositional behavior, but I don't think it's diagnostically significant. I'm getting a, a very um, severe hand gesture, which means I'm going to leave the stage, and I thank you for your attention.